uh, I climbed the all-important uh, corporate ladder, covered six states. But as a kid, at 10 years old, I bailed hay and put tobacco up on farms. My first real job was a, a bag boy at 14 years old. I uh, excelled in grocery stores and convenience stores and ended up being a vice president of an oil company in Cincinnati and then on to an executive management position with Speedway Petroleum. And then in 1988, I opened uh, my first company and I've had three different companies that I've bought and sold um, over the years. And uh, I had, didn't have a silver spoon in my mouth. I learned lessons the hard way. I was meeting payrolls, paying high rents, like a Broadway at the beach, loan payments. So I knew a two a thing about business, large and small. I'm a fast learner. I think outside of the box and I adopt the change very fast. I, have an I got really fed up with the, the country. I uh, saw homeless in the streets. I saw 10 cities in LA and San Francisco. I saw drugs being sold, addicts in the street. The infrastructure of this country is falling apart. I watched people crossing the border unchecked, and that really concerned me. Then I come home back in November, and I see our District 7 with a 30% poverty rate in four different counties, losing high paying manufacturing jobs. I saw our Congressman not uh, doing his job. and. Uh, I really thought I needed to do something, and uh, that's basically why I'm running. And uh, I want to be your next congressman. I'm Mal Hyman. I've been a teacher for 42 years in the public schools, five years in a medium security men's prison, the last 30 years at Coker College. I've been a Democrat since I worked for Bobby Kennedy, canvassing for him. I uh, met my wife in uh, 1991. I ran a panel discussion on homelessness at the college, and she was there and started talking to her, wanted to get her to volunteer on the issue, and we've been talking ever since. Great fortune of two parents uh, that were stable. Uh, my mom said, all you need to do is follow the golden rule. That's all I'm asking. And my dad said, tell the truth no matter what. I fought against the Nazis. They were pretty clear. I came of age in 1968 when the country was divided as it is today. Uh, I saw friends of mine when I was playing basketball in high school. Their brothers were in gangs. Others' parents had been through the Holocaust. I could see the air I was breathing. We had riots in over 100 cities. I started to think seriously about politics. On a trip to the Middle East in 1973, walking through Jerusalem, I decided I'd try to be a teacher. In graduate school, friends were telling me, if you want to know what's going on in the world, studying international relations, you have to go to the war zones. Went to Nicaragua in 1985, went to the Middle East to monitor the Intifada in 1988, monitored the election in Nicaragua in the war zone in 1990, I found those trips where you do a lot of listening invaluable. Did a lot of listening while I was in the prisons, found when people fell into despair. Uh, the, uh, I, I seek to serve as first member of Congress that could talk about the school to prison pipeline that's taught in the public schools and taught in the prisons. Uh, I see right now a president who doesn't respect the rule of law. He is reckless, he is impulsive, he's racist, He's sexist. He borrowed from Mussolini's playbook. Mussolini said, drain the swamp. We were looking at somebody who says he could pardon himself. He is a source of problems, but a symptom of problems. Transnational corporations are pledging allegiance to the best investment opportunity, not to the United States. All other advanced industrial societies invest in their own country. They're all being hit by outsourcing and automation. But to understand you have to invest in people, invest in creating jobs, invest in sustainable energy to create jobs, opportunity, and security in the country. Right now, our Congress is blinded by money. The wealthiest 1% with 97% of the money in the Congress. And they blind Congress to the interest of working people. I'm not going to take a dime of corporate or banking money because no man can serve two masters.
Good evening. My name is Bruce Fisher. I am running for Congress in the 7th District here in South Carolina. First thing I'm going to do, and this is new for me, I'm going to agree with the Republican. I think our current congressman is not doing his job. Not doing the job for the South Carolinians that he's supposed to be serving. Like our president, he is serving, again as Mal alluded to, the financial donors, the masters. The, the tax bill that was recently passed that he goes around our district touting is a windfall for corporations that are already making a fortune. It's a windfall for the rich donor class who put all the money into politics. The average working person is seeing little, if any, benefit from this tax plan. And what they do see is going to be eroded over the next 10 years. We're being left having to pay for this on the shoulders of our children and grandchildren. And that's just not right. One and a half trillion dollars of additional debt. For what? To make the rich richer? Not good. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I am a uh, U.S. Army veteran. I flew helicopters in Vietnam. Uh, I found that was a good experience to learn about international relations, too. Uh, after my military service, I uh, went to school and got my doctorate in clinical psychology. Worked as a uh, psychologist for in excess of 30 years until I retired a few years ago. Just an interesting point, and this is not something I've ever mentioned before publicly. Uh, my father passed away from a heart attack at age 46. I was six years old. My mother raised her two sons, a six-year-old and an eight-year-old, by herself. My mother never finished eighth grade. She instilled the importance of education into her sons to the point where my brother and I both earned doctorates. My brother was a college professor his adult life. I went into a different field. We've heard a lot tonight about the importance of education. It's important, but it starts at home, and it always has to start at home. Uh, my platform primarily is on health care. I've worked in a health-related field all my adult life. We have the Affordable Care Act, which could use some fixing, but it's a good start. What we really need, and what will come down the pike at some point, is national improved Medicare for all. It's proven to work, it's cheaper than commercial insurance, and my time is up. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bruce. Hi, my name is Bill Hopkins. Uh, I'm an attorney in Pauley's Island, South Carolina. I live with my wife, Rachel, who's here tonight. And uh, our, we have an 11-year-old son, Jack, who attends Waccamaw Intermediate School. I have a son, Clay, who practices law with me. He's here tonight. And I have a daughter named Jordan who uh, lives in Charleston. She's in Sales. So we've lived in Pauley's Island for about uh, seven years now. I was born and raised in Lee County, South Carolina, Bishopville. My mother was one of 13 children. Uh, my grandmother actually gave birth to 14, one died at birth. Uh, to say they were poor would be an understatement. They were, of course, farmers uh, at a produce roadside stand on Highway 15. And uh, me, my cousins, my siblings, all of us grew up working on a farm. We understood hard work. My parents were not wealthy, but they instilled in me values that I think are more important, honesty, integrity, and a great work ethic. So after graduating high school, I was very fortunate to obtain an academic scholarship to NC State University. And when I graduated, I did the same thing my father did and my uncle did and my grandfather did. I went to work in a textile mill in Lancaster, South Carolina, actually in Mandy Norell's district, Springs Industries. And as crazy as this will sound, I, I like working third shift in a textile mill. We made something. We printed sheets and comforters and things like that. Uh, my, the company Springs Industries, the plant I worked in called the Grace Dying and Finishing Plant no longer exists. Every, all 700 people, including me, we lost our jobs. I've seen firsthand the effects that terrible trade policies can have. Um, the textile industry, 230,000 jobs in the Carolinas alone gone from bad trade policies. But I was one of the very lucky ones. I had saved a little bit of money 
and I was able to get into law school. Uh, I did not have any lawyers in my family, didn't even know a lawyer when I got into law school. But when I got out through the grace of God and good luck, I was able to get a job at one of the best law firms in South Carolina, and it was a tremendous experience. And I've spent the last 26 years representing working class people, the kind of people that I grew up with, my family, my relatives, the people I worked in a textile mill with. That is what my campaign is all about, working class people. Uh, unfortunately, so, Mr. Hyman, we'll start with you on this. Um, I'd like to hear from each of you specifically one thing you think that Congress is doing wrong right now and one thing you think they're doing right. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Hyman. Oh, okay. Uh, it, it's hard to find much that I agree with with this Congress. And this would be true for the previous Congress as well because of the money that's flooding the political system. I mean, now we have the wealthiest 1% putting in 97% of the money into the election process. Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission, which is a Supreme Court decision, opened the doors for unlimited money to come in on the grounds of freedom of speech. And you don't have to disclose where the money is coming from. So Russian oligarchs put money into the NRA, which which helped Donald Trump get elected, but money is coming into all of the 501c4s, and we aren't able to track it at this point. And it pushes Congress into acting in those interests so that it's uh, allowing uh, coal mining waste to come into rivers. That's something that happened the last couple days. Or taking money from research on sustainable energy, or cutting payments uh, to food stamps. So I see the decisions made by this Congress consistently helping the wealthy, hurting the middle class, and hurting the poor. I don't see this Congress working well across the aisle in the spirit of Eisenhower or in the spirit of Ronald Reagan to cut deals, to see practical politics being in the middle of the field where under those administrations, Gridlock was seen as grandstanding, and compromise was seen as common sense. I'm not seeing that from this administration. So I see, basically, a tax bill that benefited the very wealthy, as Bruce talked about. It could be as high as 80% of the benefits went to the wealthiest 1%. I see proposals coming from this Congress to cut the number of people that were on the, the Affordable Care Act by about 20 million and to give $800 billion to the wealthy. Now that didn't get passed by the Senate, but that's where the House of Representatives was. So I'm afraid I don't see much progress with this Congress on things that I would applaud, and there's a lot, a lot of cause for concern. Mr. Fisher. I will also agree that I don't see a whole lot productive that's coming out of the current Congress. What bothers me most about the Congress that we have now is their silence. We have a president who is, in my estimation, a stone-cold fascist, racist, misogynist, the list goes on. And the Congress, with a few exceptions, very few exceptions, is silent. They need to speak up and they need to speak up based on some kind of evidence, not these conspiracy theories that continually uh, are floated. The Congress is silent, not just on the president, but on several of the cabinet members. We had Betsy DeVos go on 60 Minutes a few months back and try to convince people that taking money away from public schools that are in trouble and giving it to charter schools is going to somehow help the public schools. I'm sorry, I worked for a lot of years in psychology. I know crazy when I see it, and that was crazy. And I don't hear anybody in Congress on the Republican Party saying a word about it. They're silent. They're silent about the scandals in the EPA. Scott Pruitt, by any measure, is the most scandal-ridden cabinet secretary in history. 
He's taken the P out of the EPA. There is no protection for the environment anymore. And nobody is saying a word except the Democrats. They have to know better. Some of these people do have a science background, but they're being silent. That's what's wrong with the Congress the way it is right now. And we have to change the dynamic in Congress by electing more Democrats in order to make that change. Thank you. So Charles, if I could start with two areas where I think that uh, Congress has gone wrong, uh, and of course they've already been mentioned. The first is the tax fiasco. Uh, I don't know if any of you saw it today. Another great article came out today. It's one of six or seven I've seen in the past week where the studies clearly show this tax bill has had no effect, if, if any, negligible on the working class people. The money, $180 billion, has been used by corporations to buy their own stock back. That's the number one source of where the tax money went for corporations to buy back. The second largest uh, source of the money where it went, executive level compensation and boards of directors. So we passed a tax law for which the working people may have gotten a $500 check and the corporate CEOs whose bonuses are based on the price of their stock have used it to buffet up their stock prices by buying it back. Number two, as Bruce said, the environment. I, I'm just shocked that even Republicans, how can you say that doing away with environmental protection helps create jobs? That that's, that's what I can't fathom. Donald Trump has, total, or Scott Pruitt, totally done away with over 100 regulations. And they say, oh God, now that these regulations are gone, gosh, folks, the jobs are gonna, boy, y'all gonna be hiring people next week. That's such crap. No jobs are being created by eliminating these regulations. They're there for a reason to prevent you seen the ones he's done away with. Mining companies can dump their waste into a river unfiltered. Those are the things he's done. Now, what have they done good? So far, nothing. They have a chance. Donald Trump is saying, let's review our trade policies. Let's look at NAFTA. China's been sticking it to us for 20 years. NAFTA, me, my father, my uncle, my uh, grandfather, all our textile mills closed from NAFTA. Let's reevaluate them. This is a chance to do something good. Put some, reevaluate our trade policies, put some in place that'll keep jobs in the seventh district and quit sending them to Mexico. So they have an opportunity. I'm confident they'll blow it, but they have a chance. Thank you. Um, so Mr. Heim, we'll start with you on this. Um, I'd like to hear from each of you specifically one thing you think that Congress is doing wrong right now and one thing you think they're doing right. Uh, we'll start with Mr. Oh, okay. uh, it, it's hard to find much that I agree with with this Congress. And this would be true for the previous Congress as well because of the money that's flooding the political system. I mean, now we have the wealthiest 1% putting in 97% of the money into the election process. Citizens United versus the Federal Election Commission, which is a Supreme Court decision opened the doors for unlimited money to come in on the grounds of freedom of speech. And you don't have to disclose where the money is coming from. So Russian oligarchs put money into the NRA, which, which helped Donald Trump get elected. But money is coming into all of the 501c4s, and we aren't able to track it at this point. And it pushes Congress into acting in those interests so that it's uh, allowing uh, coal mining waste to come into rivers. That's something that happened the last couple days. Or taking money from research on sustainable energy. Or cutting payments uh, to food stamps. So I see the decisions made by this Congress consistently helping the wealthy, hurting the middle class, and hurting the poor. I don't see this Congress working well across the aisle in the spirit of Eisenhower or in the spirit of Ronald Reagan to cut deals, to see practical politics being in the middle of the field where under those administrations, gridlock was seen as grandstanding and compromise was seen as common sense. I'm not seeing that from this administration. So I see basically a tax bill that benefited the very wealthy, as Bruce talked about, it could be as high as 80% of the benefits went to the wealthiest 1%. I see proposals coming from this Congress 
to cut the number of people that were on the, the Affordable Care Act by about 20 million and to give $800 billion to the wealthy. Now that didn't get passed by the Senate, but that's where the House of Representatives was. So I'm afraid I don't see much progress with this Congress on things that I would applaud, and there's a lot, a lot of cause for concern. I will also agree that I don't see a whole lot productive that's coming out of the current Congress. What bothers me most about the Congress that we have now is their silence. We have a president who is, in my estimation, a stone cold fascist, racist, misogynist, the list goes on. And the Congress, with a few exceptions, very few exceptions, is silent. They need to speak up, and they need to speak up based on some kind of evidence, not these conspiracy theories that continually uh, are floated. The Congress is silent, not just on the president, but on several of the cabinet members. We had Betsy DeVos go on 60 Minutes a few months back and try to convince people that taking money away from public schools that are in trouble and giving it to charter schools is going to somehow help the public schools. I'm sorry, I worked for a lot of years in psychology. I know crazy when I see it, and that was crazy. And I don't hear anybody in Congress on the Republican Party saying a word about it. They're silent. They're silent about the scandals in the EPA. Scott Pruitt, by any measure, is the most scandal-ridden cabinet secretary in history. He's taken the P out of the EPA. There is no protection for the environment anymore. And nobody is saying a word except the Democrats. They have to know better. Some of these people do have a science background, but they're being silent. That's what's wrong with the Congress the way it is right now, and we have to change the dynamic in Congress by electing more Democrats in order to make that change. Thank you. So Charles, if I could start with two areas where I think that uh, Congress has gone wrong, uh, and of course they've already been mentioned. The first is the tax fiasco. I don't know if any of you saw it today. Another great article came out today. It's one of six or seven I've seen in the past week where the studies clearly show this tax bill has had no effect, if, if any, negligible on the working class people. The money, $180 billion, has been used by corporations to buy their own stock back. That's the number one source of where the tax money went for corporations to buy back. The second largest uh, source of the money where it went, executive level compensation and boards of directors. So we passed a tax law for which the working people may have gotten a $500 check and the corporate CEOs whose bonuses are based on the price of their stock have used it to buffet up their stock prices by buying it back. Number two, as Bruce said, the environment. I, I'm just shocked that even Republicans, how can you say that doing away with environmental protection helps create jobs? That that's, that's what I can't fathom. Donald Trump has, total, or Scott Pruitt, totally done away with over 100 regulations. And they say, oh God, now that these regulations are gone, gosh, folks, the jobs are gonna, boy, y'all gonna be hiring people next week. That's such crap. No jobs are being created by eliminating these regulations. They're there for a reason to prevent, have you seen the ones he's done away with? Mining companies can dump their waste into a river unfiltered. Those are the things he's done. Now, what have they done good? So far, nothing. They have a chance. Donald Trump is saying, let's review our trade policies. Let's look at NAFTA. China's been sticking it to us for 20 years. NAFTA, me, my father, my uncle, my uh, grandfather, all our textile mills closed from NAFTA. Let's reevaluate them. This is a chance to do something good. Put some, reevaluate our trade policies, put some in place that'll keep jobs in the seventh district and quit sending them to Mexico. So they have an opportunity. I'm confident they'll blow it, but they have a chance. Thank you. Um, hello? Yeah. I'll have to address these. I'm the Republican part of this. And uh, Mr. Hillary, 
I mean, Mr. Hyman, can you go ahead and say that rant again for me? Uh, racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic. That's right. Okay. Why do we have to call names to everybody? He's your president. He is my president. And that offends me. I'm trying to be descriptive as I would be in a classroom. I'd be lying if I didn't call a spade a spade on this. Well, it's my talk, and I, I, well, I'll say you, how it is. Stop asking these questions. <laughs> our, our, our president has done, he's got an unemployment rating at 4.1%, the lowest since 2000, so the largest troop tape raise in eight years, confirmation of recorded number of conservative judges, which I'm proud of, ISIS is almost destroyed, crack down on gang violence like MS-13, securing our border, stock market at historic highs, corporate and individual tax decreases, fair trade actions, tariffs coming apart, and we're globally fair trading finance. And then a 3.8 GMP from one, negative 1% 1 from the Obama administration, America back to work, bringing, bringing our jobs back, bringing rocket man to the tables, deregulating our overregulated government, pulling out of climate regulating control, I'm saying my piece. Just a little quieter. Then. I will. My biggest concern is this rant it doesn't do any good for anybody. This name calling is just ridiculous. It's not name calling. <laughs> Wait, Rocket Man? So, Rocket Man? Who was the amazing question? Okay, the question, I think our Congress is doing a great job because I'm from the corporate world. I'm from the business world. I can see what our president is doing. His policies are sound and secure. He's bringing jobs back. That is good for America. You all can shake your heads. I know I'm a Republican here. I see all the shaking heads going on. How many, how many Republicans are in this room right now? Two. Should I even, even stay up here and talk? Just leave? Very good. Thank you, folks. Well, as I've said, <clears throat> said before publicly, uh, I'm ambivalent about I-73. Apparently the permits have been secured, the funding is almost in place, and it would bring jobs to South Carolina. Hopefully most of those jobs would be for South Carolinians and not for contractors being imported from other states. I do have some other issues related to I-73. One has to do with what I see as unregulated and excessive and fast growth without regard for the basic infrastructure. I-73 is one highway. It would bring a lot of people in. Where do you put them? They're building houses like mad. I don't see them building more roads. Does anybody enjoy going down uh, no. Highway 17 in, in mid-season? I don't, I try to avoid it. There's also the issue of what happens to businesses along the other routes into Myrtle Beach when you get a superhighway to take some of the traffic away from them. They run the risk of losing business. Like I said, I'm conflicted about it. I, I don't know if ultimately it would be a good thing or not. I've also noticed the pace of construction, highway construction, here in South Carolina, it is rather slow. If this process goes forward, I'm not sure I'll be alive to see the end of it. That's all I have to say about that issue. Uh, thank you, I'll be brief. So. Uh, I-73, of course, like most of Congressman Rice's, pro Rice's projects, is strictly about Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It is designed and uh, will benefit hotel owners and developers and real estate. Those are the folks he tends to just represent. 
But let me say this, uh, I don't have all the answers, but during my call time, we call three to five hours a day every day, we call people, which I'm not always a fan of, but I've spoken to over 100 people in Dillon County, and boy, they've given me an earful. Do you know that right now there's no projected exit to get off of I-73 into Dillon, South Carolina? Here's a rural area in South Carolina that sorely needs economic development, sorely needs people getting off the interstate, stopping at the gas station in the store, and yet I-73 has no proposed exit. They talk about the inland port. What about these small counties up in Dillon where I-73 is coming through? So I think there's got to be, a, they should revisit the study. How can we let I-73 benefit something other than a hotel in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina? I live here, I want the hotels to do well. But hell, let's spread the wealth. Let's let the uh, rural communities up in Dillon, Mary, and Marlboro, let them benefit from I-73 too, if we're gonna proceed. And also, again, we've got to look out and protect. Uh, I know the permits have already been done, but the environmental protection, as Bruce said, we're developing for the sake of development. There must be a plan. We're dealing with this in Pauley's Island right now. Growth is great, but plan for it. Don't just say we're going to go build, build, build. All development is good. Development can be great, but it's got to be uh, controlled with a plan. So I-73, I won't say I'm for it or against it yet. I think I would probably be against it in its current format without more benefit to the rural communities and only benefiting Myrtle Beach. Thank you. As a corporate Corporate executive, I feel that I-73 is needed. If I'm a corporation coming into this state, I'm going to be looking at three areas. I'm going to be looking at education and seeing how my, what kind of people I have that will be working for me. Um, one second thing I'm going to look at is infrastructure. Can I get my goods and my services to market fast? Third thing I'm going to be looking for is tax incentives. I-73 is needed. It needs to be an east and west expressway coming into this area, all through the other counties. And it just is, uh, it has to happen if, uh, if I'm a corporate uh, company going to come into this state. The American Society of Civil Engineers rates our infrastructure D. We clearly need nationwide to make those investments. <coughs> Under the Eisenhower administration, they tax the wealthy and responsibly paid for it. And just speaking in general, it's not just roads, bridges, sewer systems, it's also the electrical grid. The waits on public housing are five years in big cities. Schools that are crumbling, there's a lot of infrastructure to be rebuilt. The plan coming from the Trump administration is to have $200 billion come from the federal government and the rest come from the states. It's a non-starter. It wasn't meant to be serious. When they talk about these roads, they're talking about toll roads. To I-73, I read through the report slowly because I had to go through these debates the last time on I-73. And I remained open but skeptical. The estimates on the number of jobs on Highway 22 were way off, and they're off on this set of estimates as well. We could more efficiently build up Highway 9, 501, and other roads out of Georgetown for hurricane evacuation and relieve some of the problems on our roads, which are necessary, and do it without hurting wildlife and the wetlands as much. So I see a more efficient use of money rebuilding other roads. I remain open, but skeptical. If they do a new report on this and they have better assumptions, I'll look at it again. Um, all right, Mr. Hopkins, we're gonna start with you this time. Um, I'd like to hear from you about uh, your thoughts on energy policy, um, and if you could also touch on offshore trailer. Sure. And we'll go like that. Hello? Thanks. Sorry about that. Okay, so yes, I believe everybody's in agreement on this. I'm totally 100% opposed to offshore drilling. Uh, we have the most beautiful uh, natural resources in South Carolina, particularly in the 7th District. We're unique. We have rivers, marshland, creeks, the ocean. It's incredible, an abundance of natural resources. Why you would ever risk that to offshore drilling is beyond me. The numbers prove that the benefit, economic benefit from offshore drilling will not be 10% of what we get from our $20 billion tourist industry. Uh, so I believe, hopefully everybody agrees on that. I've said this before, my wife 
Uh, her, she's from Southwest Louisiana, and if you live there, you only do two things, farm sugar cane or work in oil and gas. Her entire family, her father, brother, they've worked on offshore oil rigs their whole lives. They come over here, they're coming this weekend. You know what they say when they come over here? Bill, why would you ever have offshore drilling on your coast? It's ridiculous. They made that decision because they don't have our beaches. They don't have it. It was an economic necessity. They made the correct decision for them that the benefits of offshore drilling and oil and gas drilling are superior to what they may get from tourism on the coast. For us, it's totally reversed. Um, energy infrastructure, or energy, let's talk about energy some. I'd like to say this, I have, um, not to pat myself on the back, I'm an attorney, I was just appointed by a federal judge to be one of the lead lawyers in a class action suit I have brought on behalf of uh, the shareholders and uh, of SCE and G against the officers and directors. These folks, the officers and directors, were taking $1 million, $2 million bonus checks and taking them to the bank and cashing them when they knew full well these things were never going to come online. They had zero chance. The Bechtel report had been issued. Westinghouse was underwater. The cost overruns. And yet these folks continued to get their bonus checks. It's disgusting. It's sickening. I want to say this about Congressman Rice. He hadn't done a whole lot for South Carolina. Let me tell you the one piece of legislation Congressman Rice introduced in Congress, an amendment to the Energy Act. You see, before Congressman Rice, uh, state-owned public utilities couldn't get big tax breaks like the privately owned ones did. So Congressman Rice took his PAC money from SCANA, S-C-E-N-G, Santee Cooper, a state-owned utility, and he amended the Energy Act. So now, guess what? They get all the tax breaks that the other privately owned utilities get. I don't know about you, but I didn't see my, my bills drop when they got all their tax money. In fact, my bills went up from a, a nuclear reactor in Fairfield that'll never come online. So we need to have better energy policies, solar, wind. We have to look at alternatives. Coal is uh, no good for our environment. It's time to move on past it, although uh, President Trump is in love with it. Thank you. In my uh, travels uh, across the country and through Louisiana and down through South Texas, I look out the, at night and uh, I can see all the offshore rigs and the lights and it uh, really, uh, it was just, I didn't like it. Uh, we've got a beautiful coast here and uh, seeing the dirt and the oil from the trucks coming and going, it was not a very pretty sight uh, along the beaches uh, of the Gulf Coast. Gulf Coast waters are completely different than the Atlantic. I understand that and uh, I am for, I am not for uh, offshore drilling. I want the uh, coast to be uh, beautiful like it is, the environment left alone. Um, I cannot see us uh, having oil rigs off our coast and uh, I will do everything in my power as a congressman to vote against it. Uh, I just don't uh, think it's necessary. I think for energy we need to move away from fossil fuels. I'm for more windmills. I, out west, there's windmills all over the place. There's farm, wind farms, uh, there's solar panel farms. Uh, we need, in South Carolina, to start doing this type of energy. Uh, uh, Mother Nature will, uh, we get away from fossil fuels, uh, Mother Nature will heal itself like it does in a forest fire. Uh, so I'm just uh, want our energy policies to change a little bit, to uh, move away from fossil fuels. firmly opposed to drilling off the coast. Uh, I think Bill summarized the case of jobs, more jobs are, are threatened with the fishing industry, the tourist industry, our beautiful coastline. The oil is sold on the global market. It doesn't create any more energy security in the United States. And at this point, the price of solar is actually lower than the price of oil and coal. And that's with the subsidies that have been given to the oil and coal industry over the years. Huge subsidies given to the nuclear industry to get started. The government said they'd take care of the waste. We still haven't figured out what they're going to do with the nuclear waste. Most states didn't want to build the nuclear plants. We built them. They're not going to be finished. We're still paying for them. Congressman Rice was active in getting a billion dollar tax break for Santee Cooper. And this, this is not the direction we need to go. Seems plain. 
UN has done six studies on climate change. Each one says, with 2,000 scientists from 100 countries, things are worse than we thought. The Pentagon in 2003 said climate change is a greater threat to national security than terrorism because it changes who gets the water. We've seen in this country over the last year three hurricanes, four nor'easters. Imagine hitting Puerto Rico and we still don't have Puerto Rico rebuilt. The drought in the Middle East in Syria was a contributing factor to the war there, the drought in Yemen, the drought in southern Sudan. Those are contributing factors to wars already. The Pentagon's been writing that up. That's why when I do the Earth Day in Calmia Gardens in Hartsville, and I've been doing it the last 10 years, when the military comes in, their engineers are ahead of everyone else because they're tasked to save at least 5% on energy usage each year. They know it's a national security problem. We're not treating it as such because of the oil and coal and natural gas industry that has the Trump administration buffaloed, uh, tr Trump digs coal and all that. Couldn't be the wrong direction on it. I have a feeling future generations will deeply resent our inaction on this. Th these are actions that are changing the climate our civilization is a force of nature that's threatening our security. We're going to have to look at things differently. It's hard for us to wrap our heads around the fact that this is going to affect the poor in the future. It's going to affect uh, governments. They will become less stable as they have problems with floods, famines, fires, mass relocations. The floods in Pakistan eight years ago uh, the government wasn't able to step in and provide doctors, water, nurses, food. The Taliban did. The Pentagon realizes that these are very serious national security concerns that are also part of the energy policy. Thank you. Well, you guys have said it all. Uh, as far as offshore drilling, I think Phil Noble said it best. No. Simple no. There's absolutely no reason for it. Uh, the risk you run is, as was mentioned earlier this evening, another Deepwater Horizon event. A spill of that magnitude off of the South Carolina coast would inundate the entire coastline of this state from Georgia up into North Carolina. What does that do to the tourist industry? What does it do to the fishing industry? No can't risk it, just cannot risk it. And as was said, it's not necessary. We're already exporting oil. What do we need more oil for? And if we're smart, we're going to be going into non-fossil fuel economy. We'll always need some fossil fuel, I'm, I'm convinced. Right? Uh, the sun doesn't always shine, the wind doesn't always blow, yada yada and battery technology may not be able to keep up with our needs. So we may need to use fossil fuels, but we have enough. We have enough for a long time if we cut our usage down. And that's what we need to be doing. Do we need wind farms? Yes, absolutely do. Uh, this past summer, I was on vacation in Hawaii, and on the island of Maui, they now have wind farms beautiful tropical paradise, they have wind farms. Why? It works for them. They have a lot of wind there, and it cuts their electric bills. We can produce solar panels here in South Carolina. We have the technology. Why buy them from China and Europe? Let's manufacture them ourselves. That, that covers energy, I think. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, we are running about out of time, so we're gonna, uh, Mr. Uh, Hopkins, we're gonna start with you, and we'll do our uh, final statements, and we'll just come up the line this way. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate all of you coming tonight and allowing me to come out here and speak. I hope to get to meet each one of you earlier. Uh, as I've already told you a lot of my positions on the taxes, uh, health care, we haven't had much time to discuss things. Gosh, health care is such a shame in this country. 
Uh, I will tell you, uh, and ordinarily I wouldn't disclose it, but she's given me permission. My sister has MS. My father has cancer for the fourth time. I spent a lot of time going back and forth to do. And over the past five years, the, num the amount of letters that I've spent appealing and asking for reconsiderations on cancer policies and other things, we have a system where every decision, every medical decision in this country is made based on financial interest. The insurance companies, excuse me, don't give a damn about your health. It's only a bottom line system. What is, what is the financial effect on us? We have to find a way around that. I don't know that single payer system is the best, but I think we should look at something. We have to look at our alternatives. Obamacare was a start. Uh, of course, now the Republicans want to throw the entire thing out. We know that it has wonderful provisions that we should keep. It has bad provisions that should be revised. But ultimately, we have to find that we look at other countries, the United States, for all of our assets and our pluses to be such a developed and wealthy nation, providing health care, especially to our senior citizens, is just atrocious. Going back to taxes, I absolutely believe and intend to, the first thing I would do even as a freshman congressman is to introduce a bill, why are we taxing Social Security from our senior citizens? It's unbelievable. Ronald Reagan, the Republican's hero, in 1983 started this act. He said, I'm going to tax Social Security. Haven't our senior citizens done enough? Good gosh, you've already kept the money out of their paycheck while they were working, and now that they're not working, you want to take money out of that as well. It's a double recovery for the government. The first day I go to Congress, I can assure you I'm going to introduce a bill. I'm going to raise hell to stop taxing Social Security up to $100,000, and I'm not going to stop raising hell until I get kicked out or somebody does something about it. Frankly, I think it should be the same on 401k money. I think up to a certain limit, whether it's seventy-five dollars or $100,000, our senior citizens have done enough, they've worked hard enough, stop taking their taxes. Uh, on other issues, I believe we've discussed a lot education. Uh, education generally is a state issue, not a federal, but I think the federal government may ultimately have to get involved. I'm happy to say that as of 145 today, the South Carolina Education Association, the uh, largest and most prominent uh, public education employees association in the state for over 50 years announced that they're endorsing Bill Hopkins for Congress. So we're happy to have that endorsement. And uh, I think they understand my commitment to education. I want to do what all I can. My child attends public school. We're very lucky here. Uh, I see that I have one second. Again, thank you for your time. I'd love to talk to you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, okay, just a couple of words to add on regarding taxes. Uh, it was mentioned earlier this evening by one of the gubernatorial candidates that we want to go with a flat tax. I would be firmly, firmly opposed to that. We need a progressive tax system. That's what the Democratic Party has always stood for. The more you make, the more you should pay. Not necessarily up to a 90% tax rate. No, that's, that's kind of overboard. Uh, but what it's been cut down to now is not enough to sustain us economically. The burden is more and more being placed on people at the bottom third of the pay scale. Right? And that's just not tenable. We need more of our income in this country, government-wise, to come from income tax, which is generally a progressive tax, even though it's not working out quite that way right now. Less of a, an emphasis on sales tax, which is the opposite of a progressive tax. If you make a certain amount of money and have to pay the same tax rate on everything you buy, your, ta your effective tax rate is much higher than the wealthy people who could almost care less. But what's 4%, 6%, 8%, doesn't matter. They're not going to spend that much more. Healthcare, I talked about earlier. Uh, I'm a dog on healthcare. Having worked in the field, I've seen what private insurance companies have done to limit the coverage that people have. I was directly involved with that, fighting for my own patients to get authorization from an insurance company for them to receive treatment. It's crazy. Now, I understand even Medicare has some provisions similar to that, where some things do have to be authorized. In the plan that I envision for the future, that would not be the case. The medical decisions would be up to the patient and their, their doctors. 
as if the insurance company would have to take a backseat to that. We have to talk about the opioid crisis. We need to fund treatment facilities. If there is no funding, who is going to open a clinic? Who is going to pay for the, the treatments? We need to fund treatment, we need to fund facilities, and I'm about to run out of time, so I'll stop here. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, Grand Strand Action Together uh, and Merle B. Sun for coordinating this event. It's great in a democracy that we can discuss the issues. I appreciate the organization to pull this together. When we go back to healthcare. I think our 60 year experiment with healthcare in the private marketplace has not succeeded. And every other advanced industrial democracy says healthcare is a human right. I think it's a God given right. I think there are plenty of models out there, public and private, that we could borrow. All of them require the government to step in and do some regulation. And it can be left in the private marketplace or publicly. The Canadian system, people choose their doctors, choose their hospitals. It's run by the provinces, two thirds as expensive as ours. Everyone is covered and they live three years longer than we do and it lowers the national debt, which is why conservative Canadian businessmen wouldn't give up their system. It's as non-controversial as women voting. All we have to do is look across the border. This would benefit business. If it's two thirds as expensive, businesses currently are at a competitive disadvantage and it hurts their ability to hire. Families are at disadvantage and our dignity is threatened. One fourth of our seniors can't afford the prescription drugs that their doctors say they need. Now we have to change social security as well and there's no reason that social security taxes should be capped at $128,000. The wealthy don't pay their fair share with social security taxes as they don't pay it with income taxes. And I agree with Bill, there's no reason social security needs to be taxed. Now I glossed over some other topics. So if I might return to energy policy. For the last five years, I've had panel discussions at Coca College on energy policy. I rarely get coverage from TV and from newspapers on it. I brought in experts from Clemson that fly around the world to be consultants on wind power. Wind power already is growing very quickly in the United States, it's growing globally. We don't put the research and development money into the government programs so that we can come up with even better systems of wind power or solar energy, which then after the research is done, can be handed to the private sector so they develop it. I guess overarching idea I deeply believe in liberty and justice for all. I see there being no liberty without justice for all. They're bound like love is bound to truth. The price of liberty is eternal vigilance. That's the price of justice. That's the price of community. That's the price of peace. <clears throat> Folks, what is the role of government? Do you all know? It's to secure your rights. That's all. What does the government make? What does the government sell? Doesn't do any of that. Somebody always has to pay the price. Somebody always has to pay for it. Whether you give a free health care, free education, a free car, free weed, free smokes, free beer, no matter what you give, somebody always has to pay. There are no free lunches. I learned that way back in Economics 101. The government is you. You have to give the power to somebody to give it to you. A politician, which I am not, cannot give you a thing. He can sit up here and promise all he wants, but it's you that gives him that power. So what does the government do for you? Secure your rights. You know, the parties have different core values and beliefs. It doesn't mean that one view is right and the other is wrong. It's just a difference of opinion. 
we are going to have some real issues affecting humanity, like AI, artificial intelligence, genetics, DNA, cloning, biochemistry, layers, weapons, mass destruction, humanitarian world problems, real problems that need real solutions. And we need leaders that can see what's coming. There will be a need for regulation, but not so much. We have to have competition. We have to have companies. Companies aren't dirty. Profit is not a dirty word. We all work for them. I can see what's coming, and it's going to be some real problems coming. You know, I've been a missionary for the last 10 years, and God only sees one color. We are all in this together. We are one nation under God, indivisible, but yet we are so divided, and we need to fix it. We must respect each other. We must respect our country, our flag, our heritage, our leaders, and yes, we need to respect our president. Most of us need to be kind in our words and deeds. We need to be tolerant of our differences. We need to be less angry. To lead a group of people, you have to have a strong leader. I am that person. I will work hard and I will do my job as elected to do. I am not a lawyer. I am not a millionaire. I'm not even a politician. I am just fed up. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, candidates. And thank you all for joining us. The election, as you all know, is on Tuesday, so I know you won't forget to